today, we're joined by Mitchell Scott, who is a software engineer at the Applied Physics Lab. Uh, Mitchell, have you been with the ETL for a year? Yeah, so today's my one year anniversary, which is kind of yeah. 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 Um, So Mitchell has been working on uh, a number of projects in computer vision and in underwater robotics, and actually probably mapping localization. Yeah, localization of system or sensors and whatnot in environments. So. And uh, he's been working with uh, some of the people in EMAC on the, the adaptive monitoring package, which um, I believe most of you have heard of. If you haven't, uh, we're going to do a quick overview. Yeah. Um, and specifically on that project, he's been working with the camera data to try to automatically detect fish as they come into the, the field of view, uh, which takes a huge load off of researchers as they try to analyze the enormous amount of data. So, um, so with that, thanks, Mitchell, uh, and he's going to take away. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, as Paul was saying, uh, the talk today is on fish and marine mammal detection and AMP imagery. Uh, with the AMP is the adaptable monitoring package. Here's a photo of it on the way to swim. Uh, this was from, I think, February of last year. Um, the AMP has a series of sensors. It has uh, stereo different cameras, a uh, couple sets of sonars, an echo sounder, a current profiler, a clarity sensor, and a hydrophone array. Um, and today I'll be talking about two deployments of the AMP. One's a SQUIM at the MSL site, and for those of you who don't know SQUIM, it's right here. And also to Hawaii uh, near Honolulu, and we uh, deployed right here. Um, at these different environments, we find that there, are diver there is a diversity of animals. Um, at the MSL site, we've seen seals, we think we've seen some salmon, we're not entirely sure. Um, some squid, we've seen birds. I think I saw one shrimp. Um, <laughs> at the one side, we think we've seen tuna, and then there's a lot of different types of reef fish, as well as some larger fish that exist in the water column. Uh, one of the issues, though, from all these all these sensors is that it produces 60 plus terabytes of data per day. And from our two deployments, we had almost a million images uh, from the wet site, which is in Hawaii, and um, 8.3 million from the MSL site. Uh, and because of that, we need to use automated techniques to process all this data. And the two techniques that we went for was one, an optical approach, and two, an acoustic approach. Uh, in each one of these approaches, that's pros and cons. For optical analysis, we find that there's a high level of detail in the imagery. However, there's a short viewing range due to turbidity in the water, and also distance is decimated. Uh, for acoustic, we find that distance is maintained and it operates in turbid water. But the y axis is decimated and the y field of view is relatively short. Um, it has low resolution and it's difficult to observe near the sensor. Uh, so here's a couple of examples. This first one is a starry flounder, which we've seen near the MSL site. Um, it appears pretty nice in the optical imagery. In the acoustic imagery, we can see it approach the sensor and then leave the sensor. And it's relatively clear that it's it's some sort of object. I don't I don't think it's clear that it's a starry flounder unless you have looked at lots of acoustic images. Uh, but as it approaches the sensor, you can see how much it, it kind of blows up from the sensor. For example, as another example, uh, here's a seal. This is at the MSL side as well. And in this video, unfortunately, it cuts off and we don't get to see it swim away. But you can imagine that if it swam for another couple seconds, it would disappear into the water. And once again, the acoustic signature for this. Um, you can see you can see the uh, see the seal, but then it disappears. And the reason that it disappears, I think, is because of the short viewing range of Y. Actually, at the end there, I think you can see its tail, and, yeah, and then it disappears out of the field. So you can see that these two different sensing modalities complement each other a little bit. Where the Y we can see, in, or uh, the optical we can see Y, the acoustic we can see. And for this talk, I'm only going to be talking about um, the optical classification. Okay, so for the optical. Uh, classification, we utilize a, stero, a pair of stereo um, allied vision Manta cameras, and they're located here on the end, uh, forward facing, right in the middle. Um, and our detection approach, we, we try two different approaches. The first one is a background subtraction approach, where we attempt to find foreground from motion. And the second is a deep learning approach, where we utilize the global model, which I'll go into later on. Um, both of these approaches utilize the camera intrinsics and extrinsics, so I want to talk about that very briefly. 
Uh, camera intrinsics describe how points in space are projected onto an image lens. And we typically calibrate these points using the checkerboard method. And um, this has been kind of the standard processing since this paper came out. Um, to calibrate, we have a checkerboard. We place it in the environment. You have to rotate it to a series of views and essentially cover the entire uh, field of view. We tried both a tank calibration um, using the Ocean Science Building tank, as well as an either an in situ calibration or a dock site calibration for our points. Um, and you can see that this could potentially be a pain. For in situ, we have to have divers to actually swim in the water and move it around. And for the, the tank calibration, Paul and I would drag a flat like through water for an hour. It's not very fun. Um, we did find that there was a pretty small difference between the in situ calibration and the tank calibration. Um, but that's most likely due to variations in how we were holding the poses. So this, this variation is pretty small. But we did find a pretty big difference between using uncompressed images and, and lots of compressed images. Um, and, that, and that's shown here. For our uncompressed BMP images have a um, RMS error, which describes essentially the accuracy of the calibration um, this level, which is a little bit higher than usual. And the JPEG images are, are quite good. Um, in addition to the intrinsics, we have to utilize the extrinsics, which I, I described here. These describe the relation of the cameras relative to one another. And we typically describe it by this matrix here, where T is a three-dimensional vector, fairly translation, and R is a three by three orthonormal matrix. Um, from the stereo extrinsics, we can describe this diagram of how the cameras are configured. The cameras are separated by baseline B. There is a um, dead zone right here, which has a distance delta from the camera where neither camera can see. We have this region right here, which is, is described by theta, and that's the combined field of view of both cameras. And then we also have the total field of view of the two cameras. And from our calibration, we got these, um, these numbers where each camera's field of view is about 64 degrees uh, horizontally, and it has a 58 degree vertical field of view. So we have an L right here. And our blind zone is about six centimeters, and the separation between the two cameras is four centimeters. All right, so with that, we can start with uh, the first approach, which was the background construction method. And this approach is relatively simple. If something moves, we're going to classify it, or we're going to we're going to say that that's a detection. And it's very simple, but if we look at the typical MSL image, where we are just looking essentially at a sun in the water column, or if there's clouds, we're just looking at a blank uh, image of the water column. Uh, this, this is potentially a, a flexible application. And so the, the flow chart for this is relatively straightforward. Where we take an image, we apply the mixture of Gaussian background subtraction method, which I'll describe in a second. We filter and threshold that image, and if we see motion, then we'll classify it or classify it as a detection. Uh, the mixture of Gaussians is a relatively standard background subtraction method. Um, each pixel we represent as an independent variable, uh, separate from all the other pixels. And we describe it as a series of Gaussians, um, described by this equation here, where n, of course, is normal, and we have our mean and standard deviation. With each new pixel, we update our weights, our means, and our standard deviations. Um, when a new observation comes in, we order these Gaussians in descending order with respect to the weight and standard deviation. And then we build a series of potential background distributions based on this threshold of value. And if a new pixel comes in that meets one of the Gaussians, we classify that as a background. So uh, I, won't, I won't go too deep into this, but we can see it in, in, in practice here. We have the seal, and when we apply this, it becomes very clear that the background is separated from the seal motion. Um, however, when we apply this to the MSL data, we found that there was a lot of false positives. And this isn't exactly shocking, but it was, it was quite a bit higher than uh, so here we can see turbidity. At, this is at night, so there's zero <laughs> light splashing. Um, and this amount, of or this amount of noise was pretty difficult to filter. We also found, and this is very shocking, that the sun was impacting the images a lot. This is an image of us just looking at the sun in the water column. And we can see that despite no motion, the noise blows up. And in many cases, this will be extremely dramatic and almost impossible to filter. And so because of these two, we found that when we applied this to the MSL data, we had a lot of false positives. We found 97% of our detections were false positives. And the majority of these were due to the sun-based effects, about a quarter. And biofouling debris and sun-based were about at three quarters. 
Um, furthermore, when we apply this approach to the WETS data set in Hawaii, we have further complications, which we can see here. Uh, this is taken from the WETS data set. We can see there is a midwater flow in all the images, and there's also an abundance of reef fish that tend to appear close to the images. Reef fish appear in almost every image, and we don't want to detect every reef, uh, reef fish as a positive classification because we would find that pretty much every detection would happen. Um, and so to deal with this, we have to utilize um, the extrinsics as well. And effectively, our strategy here was there are these, these zones that only one camera sees, but it does not exist in the, the mind field of view. And then this region is relatively small. This, this is obviously not from the scale at all. But if, if we go and specifically look at the left camera, we find that a quarter meter out from the left camera, there exists a zone of about 0.15 meters where if, if a fish were to exist in that region, only the left camera would see it. And because reef fish tend to um, exist very close to the air, we essentially want to detect, uh, detect correspondence between the two images. And, to, um, and then the second complicating factor was the midwater floats. Um, and so we need to essentially threshold our images to understand that we're going to be seeing motion in every image and, and uh, find the threshold which essentially comes uh, come to that. Uh, so here are the, that same image background subtracted. On top, we see Mantle 1, which is the left camera. And on the bottom, we see Mantle 2, which is the right camera. Um, and you can, you can see the differences between the, the two images. Um, we find that a reef fish will appear in Mantle 1, but not in Mantle 2. Um, and our strategy here is to apply some filtering to re reduce the noise. Um, and then of the, of the pixels that remain, we're essentially going to make them larger and blockier and um, put them on the same image plane. So we can see that demonstrated here, where Mantle 1 and Mantle 2 um, are put onto the bottom image plane, which is preserving the fish here and reducing most of the other fish noise as well. Um, we find, of course, that there are times, even, even if it's not the same fish, that they will appear over here because they're laughing. Right? Um, but we see that we're able to reduce a lot of that, a lot of the noise using this technique. Uh, we're never able to remove the midwater float because it's, it's you know, appears pretty much the same as both images. Um, and so we have to threshold that out. Um, however, despite these attempts, we still find that there was a very high false positive rate. And we found that it was very difficult to tune. Um, for example, the reef fish required the use of these stereo properties. Um, stereo pop correspondence was required, and the midwater flow required all this threshold thing. It was really, really hard to find the series of parameters which both made classification possible but didn't overload us with false positives. However, this approach has been shown to be applicable in environments where there's a lot less motion, uh, specifically. People have deployed this to the Strait of Georgia at about 150 meters, and you're looking downward. And this works extremely well because there's much less debris, there's almost no biofouling, and you'll detect pretty much anything that moves, as opposed to a deep learning classification, which will almost always miss something, even if it's perfect. And so because of that, we have to try a different approach. And the approach that we went for is deep learning. Um, and deep learning, of course, is the the biggest buzzword in the world, essentially, in the so I'll, I'll be relatively brief. But the idea is that we have a training set which consists of images of the scene and also labels of the scene. We use that to train a model and we iteratively train that over 18 hours or whatever. It spits out something that is tuned to the data set that I provided. We verify that it's accurate by using a series of test images that were kept, kept separate from the training process. Um, to make sure that we're not overfitted to our training set. Um, deep learning approaches to animal detection have been numerous. Um, for example, Snapshot Serengeti is a, a very large collaborative project, project that attempts to classify um, safari animals, so it's the, the lion. Um, FFDS is a classification of a coral reef, and they use, I think, mass RCN on that. And I'm familiar. And then finally, uh, a shameless self promote is uh, some of my work in trying to take scale worm classification from hydrothermal vending. Um, our, or the, the paper that's most similar to us, though, is data from PNNL. Um, and here we can see some labeled images that they provided 
or, or that they built um, for their own fish detection network. Um, this is taken from, I believe, the wet scan um, in Washington. And we, we can see that they have, this is not the output from the deep learning model, this is labeled images. So they have lots and lots of labeled images that they um, built a model on. Um, and now we, we, uh, we want to upload it. Um, when it comes to image, uh, image deep learning, there are essentially two approaches. The first is classification, in which I give it an image and it says, is an object here or what exists in this image? And the second is segmentation, which is where in the object is this located? And specifically for our problem, we're not just in, the way that the GOA algorithm works is it divides an image into grid cells, which is shown right here. Each grid cell is responsible for one prediction. Um, and so in the second image, each grid cell will essentially say, you know, we think this is a dog, or we think it's a bike, or whatever. And based on the confidence in the bounding box, we essentially get a final confidence. This is a very, very high level view of what's happening. Um, to essentially optimize the algorithm, they, they utilize uh, three loss functions. Uh, the first is classification loss, which measures the accuracy of our output. So if we say something is a dog, but we only say with 10% confidence, and it's actually a dog, we want to have loss on that so that it's more confident when it's in the dog, right? The second is in localization loss. So when we um, actually produce a bounding box, we want it to be as accurate to our graph as possible. And the third is um, confidence loss. And this is a quick schematic of what's happening. It looks very similar to this. Yeah. Okay, so this is an, an example of the low output. Um, that's detecting different features in the environment. In this case, we're not um, we're not going through different um, animals. We're just doing fish. So it's just a binary classification. Um, and, and as you can see here, each instance is represented on each of these All right. So the goal then, using this model, is to build a YOLO model using labeled AMP images. However, this is extremely difficult because data curation is hard. In order to build this model, I need to have lots and lots of images of AMP data. But how am I going to get that when there's, you know, I mean, it's, it's counterintuitive, right? Um, and so we have to physically label the location of each animal. And to do that, we use labeling, um, where I have to physically drag a bounding box over a seal, to say it's a seal. <laughs> and you have to do that, you know, 10,000 times. It takes, it takes very, very long time. Um, and so this is one of the fundamental problems with this. Um, and so because we didn't have enough data to start this, we didn't have enough um, data to say this is a, a larger interesting fish versus, versus smaller reef fish. Um, we had to start with a model that was a more generic all fish model. Um, and so for our initial model, what we did is we utilized a lot of the PNNL images that I showed earlier uh, from the dam. Uh, we can identify reef fish because they're present in almost all images, this was relatively easy to find. Um, we took detections from an acoustic classification model, um, and then also from our background subtraction model, even though the false positive was very high, uh, we were able to identify a few um, cases that we can use for our deep learning model. Okay, so our first model here, I'm calling it M1. It's, it's um, it had this composition. We had 29,000 images from PNNL and 900 images from WETS, which was the light deployment, um, where the 900 images were only refish. So we do not have any of the larger fish that we're actually trying to detect in this. And when we did this model, here's, here's a couple of examples. Uh, this first case, we see two fish that it correctly identified, and the bounding boxes appear appropriate to both of them. In this next case, we see the tail of a fish. And the bounding, it seems to have identified that it's a fish, but its bounding box is pretty bad. It doesn't actually encompass what it's reporting exactly. In this next case, it seems to do a good job, but this bounding box in particular is much larger than the fish itself. Um, here we missed three fish, which isn't great. Um, and then in this case, this is a uh, photo of tuna. There's actually another tuna here and another one down here. That's almost impossible for a person to see. They missed both of those. And then finally, here's a school of fish. And even though I don't really want to detect reef fish, I do want to detect schools of reef fish. I see probably a little bit harder. Um, but here we can see it missed a lot of reef fish. Um, and you, you actually can't tell, but there's a lot of fish in this uh, sunny area too that you can see. And so it was okay. <laughs> good, good, I mean, not good. Worse than good, better than bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what we did with this first model is we utilized it to train 
multiple ones. So I did an exhaustive search through our million images to find, you know, more examples. And we just we just kind of kept that process going to build a better data set. And we came up with model two. So I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, before we go there, uh, the, mod, the actual evaluation of the model. Um, the way that we evaluate segmentation models is by utilizing um, intersection of reunion, which is defined here. Um, our ground truth, which is uh, supplied by you know, some of these labeled images and the detection. Uh, we find the area of intersection and we divide it by the entire, uh, the entire union between the two value boxes. And if this value is greater than some threshold that we supply, then we classify that as a true positive, otherwise it's false. Um, the actual evaluation parameters we use are precision and recall. Precision describes the likelihood that a prediction is correct. So if I say that my model has a 0.95 uh, precision, that means that if I give it, if it tells me that a fish is here, I'm 95% sure a fish is actually there based on our IOU structure. Um, recall is the same as the true positive prediction. Um, we utilized an IOU of 0.4, which is uh, lower than is typically used. But in this case, I think it's okay because I care less about exact overlap and more about actual detection, which is why I use that. And we find our precision is relatively high. You know, 9.91 is not bad at all, but our recall is very low. And what that means is that when it tells me a fish is here, I'm pretty sure a fish is actually there. Right? False positives are pretty low, but it's missing a lot of fish. And we, and we saw that when we went through that um, for the actual thing. Um, so with that first model, we use, uh, we use the data as well as some exhausted searches to train our second model, uh, M2. And it existed of uh, a, uh, a lot of the wet images from Hawaii, as well as some images from NSL. And in particular, what seemed to help is a substantial amount of blank images. Uh, the blank images were able to say, this is what the water column looked like, right? This is what water looks like versus this is what a fish looks like. And in addition, we added another 800 images um, from the website. Of a lot, and a lot of those were, were large fish, so we're actually trying to do that. So we were, in this model, we actually have that. And we can see that the model starts to perform much better. Um, in this first example, uh, the detection is about the same because the first model did pretty well. In the second model, um, the bounding box in both cases still don't look great. And so I don't know if I can say that the second model did much better here. But when we go forward, we see where it really starts to perform better. Uh, this fish, in, in this case, the bounding box was much larger than the fish, right? But in this one, it's much closer, more accurately represents the position of the fish. When we get here, in this case, where there's three fish, all three are identified in this model. Uh, the tuna, it caught all three, including the hard to find tuna. And in the school, we can see the differences between all the detections. And I think they got all of them right here, I, I can't remember. And the uh, EM1 where it missed a lot. And so this model is much, much better. We can see that uh, represented here in our model performance. Uh, precision has increased quite a bit, but recall of what really jumps out. It's detecting much more, much more better. And so that's great. Okay, however, from this model, um, this is including all reef fish. And again, I really don't want to detect every one reef fish because they would just be, I mean, that's just a lot of data. And so to remove this, we, we tried a different approach here where we utilized the stereo extrinsics again. Um, and we utilized uh, image rectification. And then we did a search across uh, the common plane that it produces. Um, image rectification is described here. It is taking two images and projecting them onto a common plane. So if we have two images of houses taken from different angles where we know the extrinsics, we go through a series of rotations and twists um, to put both models on the same plane. And so we can see here that the x-axis is you know, not the same, the y-axis is, is pretty close. And so our approach here is to rectify both of these images um, and then search Manta 1 based on the location of Manta 2. And so this is an example of um, the rectified images from um, our data. And then we see these weird distortions here, and this is likely due to a calibration issue. Um, but this is, this is pretty strange. Um, you don't typically see these levels of distortion, so I'm still trying to abstract why that's existing, but I think the model is, is still appropriate. Um, and we can see the algorithm in front here. Over here is Manta 2, which is the right camera. And over here is Manta 1, which is the left camera. And we essentially insert the detection from our Yola network into Manta 1, and then we just search across 
if we find a detection that's approximately the same size and in the same location, then we say that it's true. And this way, we start to ignore some of the weaknesses. So in this case, of course, our um, our mantle one detected uh, five fish, but in, but um, it's it's the correspondence that actually uh, causes the algorithm. And so because of that, our now final detection criteria for WETS is described by this flowchart. Mantle 1 and Mantle 2 each go through a YOLO model. It's the same YOLO model that they go through um, different times. If one of them has, if, if either image had, finds six or more fish, I classify that as true because I'm kind of just calling that a fish rule. And so even if only one sees it, I don't want to go through all the processing to say it's true. Um, if, if, both, if both images see um, find greater than three fish, we also buy, classify that as true. And the reason is, is because that's a very weak point in the algorithm um, where it will probably classify as true anyway, and I just don't want to go through the processing time. <laughs> so that's not true. And then finally, if neither of those are true, we go through that stereo rectification approach that I just showed. And if that produces true, then we say it's true, otherwise we say false. So that's the update algorithm. And from the, oh, and um, the, the weak point of this is that I am not checking fish similarity, right? I'm only checking size of bounding box and location. So if, if there is a tuna here and there's a reef fish that looks to be the same size and location over here, it may it may find that that's the same detection. And so that's the meaning of the algorithm. Um, and the processing time to go through all of this is about half a second. So that's that's the YOLO model, uh, both YOLO models, and doing this very um, from uh, in, in the quick test set, uh, the precision, the final precision from the stereo algorithm is uh, relatively consistent to what it was um, for the old model. And if I if I use a criteria where we consider only fish events that are seen by both cameras to be a true positive, we find our recall to be uh, 0.76. If I consider all events, so you know, mantle one sees a fish, but mantle two doesn't, then our recall is of course lower. Uh, um, and a, a caveat on this, all of these numbers are pretty preliminary, um, is that when you do testing for, for deep learning, um, you always have to separate the test set from the train set, right? And we, we did that with all of our deep learning tests, but specifically for the stereo correspondence, we had to use some test images because there was not enough data to actually go through it. And so this is only evaluating the stereo correspondence. I'm essentially assuming that the old model is going to be perfect for this, right? Um, but um, so from this, we found that there was 36,000 detections, which is a lot, but it only consists of 3.7 of the West data. So we actually were able to reduce the amount of data we have to process pretty substantially. Uh, I haven't um, formally analyzed all the detections, but the false positive rate appears to be pretty low. And I found 452 interesting ones. Um, and so the other ones are not false positives. Most of them are uh, schools of free fish. But yeah, and I want to quickly go through uh, some of the detections that I found interesting. Um, this is the tuna on the left. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to see. And on the right is the uh, acoustic. And you can actually see the tuna in the acoustic image um, being near the midwater float. Uh, these are not a time stamp. I'll, I'll make a comment here that the arrangement of this sonar is a little confusing. Um, so this is a system, a version of the amp that was looking downward, but at a, a very kind of complex angle to observe that flow. So if you can imagine the right, rightmost line of the swath from the sonar, that is right off the water surface, the parallel of the water surface. And then the large line cutting through the top is the, the bottom. And then that the float there, kind of right, right in the middle of the swath to the right, is the vertical. Um, so, you can wrap your head around that. Does that make sense? It might help a little bit. And we have, we have some more, uh, if anyone's interested, I can you know, we'll draw a picture and we'll get some photos of this later. But we'll be, we'll be going back to what's uh, shortly, if all goes well, well, we'll get more of this sort of data, but in a much easier to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a couple more. Um, this is two fish over here. That was kind of cool. Um, you can see them around. I was at the West data as well. 
Um, you can also see the amount of motion of the midwater flow causes, you know, it's, it's a big issue to back up the turkey. Um, here we see, a, I think it's a bird, yeah, you see the birds coming up the water column. Uh, this is taken from MSL. Um, and, and this is actually, a, yeah, so it would have dived earlier, and I think we missed the dive, but we caught it on its way back up. Um, oh, yeah, this next one is a fish. <laughs> no, we have biofound one. Um, so this fish was at. That's a word. Did I say fish? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure it's a bird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so this this bird would actually come for like it was like a week straight. It was there, like or maybe not quite, but it was there a lot. Like there was a lot of infections where you would see the bird swim down to get breakfast or whatever. Finally, this is a whistling one, which I thought was really cool when I first saw it. Everyone thought that was cool. Yeah. And so this is the end. Okay. Um, so future work. Um, I really want to use the data to be able to create. Uh, networks which can actually uh, determine different events, so as opposed to these this kind of binary classification, I want to say seal, fish, bird, whatever. Um, but I don't think we have quite enough data to say this is a tuna versus this is a reef fish. Okay. Um, I wanted we want to be more of the co-registered um, detection, so being able to say this is what it looks like in optical, this is what it looks like in the reef fish. That's really interesting. And I need to see more healing of all the images, which is. Exciting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think that's all I got. Um, we do have a YouTube channel, um, it's at this horrible URL, which has all these videos and stuff. Um, you can also email me and I can yeah, send you some stuff. And we'll put this, we'll put these on um, the canvas. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, can, I can probably make a link to that on there. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering how it works to feed in all the your blank images. Like, is there a lot of sort of selection for all different conditions, and then how did you like tag it? Well, the algorithm? yeah. So when you when you tag it, the way that it works, um, the Yolo training uh, uses Darknet, which is exactly what I mean. That that was their uh, their platform. And when when you send it in, you basically give it a text file with the sensitive information. And so as I was going through the state, I would it was actually very easy to look at an image, say this is blank, right? Um, you know, click enter, it would generate the image in the point text file, and then just do that 13,000 times or whatever. And I did try to find a um, mostly uh, blank images that had um, debris in the water column, so you could tell this is debris versus the fish, as well as a lot of them where they're looking at the sun. Um, so it was kind of like, I don't know if I'd say it was a, um, you know, super formal research project to find the best blank images. I, I just threw a lot at it. <laughs> yeah. Do you look at crowdsourcing your classification? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I think there are, so there's Zooniverse, which is a pretty common for the SNIPE. I think it would be great to study that. Um, yeah, I, we haven't done that, but that would be the one. <laughs> and then Amazon Turk, if you go. Yeah, so yeah. the issue with Amazon Turk is that the bounding box is not are pretty bad usually because people get paid by the image. Some people just, right. And so you do have to have a review process, but it still saves you a lot of time. And so it's kind of a trade off. The issue with Zooniverse is that you typically need to get people really excited in your project, which takes itself a lot of like startup time. So, so there are trade-offs, but crowdsourcing is definitely the way to go. I, I usually try to, you know, have um, helpers and help me <laughs> do like stuff. Yeah. Yep. Are you trying another algorithm for the point detection? We we just did not the um, or mixture of the There are millions. There are millions. Um, so the one that at um, that's talking about in the Strait of Georgia. They did something that was actually quite a bit more uh, simplistic, and it worked just as well. And so I don't know. Um, it, there might be better attempts. I'm not sure, but we, we just use mixture guessing. It's really, really easy to get going up in CBD. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess so. When when it became kind of clear that the, it was difficult to detect motion, and we pivoted to the deep learning approach, it became obvious that it was so much better. And we, we pretty much we pivoted very hard to the deep learning approach. Yeah. And so that's why we haven't really reviewed um, more of the background production approaches, but I think that was fell into what's important. Yep. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, yeah. What is the uh, kind of the, the crop, the loss of, of image region from after you went through the stereo rectification right. process? Um, we actually have really bad barrel distortion on yeah, the cameras yeah. because of the planar lens. And I'm wondering if that 
I, so I, I think that could be a cause. Um, I, I was, yeah, that's, that's definitely a cause. When we did the calibration, I, I didn't include the aim of this here, but you can see oh, it's the, like, yeah. the barrel distortion is dramatic in what the, um, the checkerboard looks like. And James and I talked about maybe thinking about an next version of the system doing something like a planar concave lens, which will actually leave the ability to keep the lens uh, surface clear, mm -hmm. but take out a little of that distortion internally. We talked about that almost a decade ago and <laughs> just went with the planar lens. So yeah. you guys get a reason to rethink that. Um, my question is whether you had any issues with the amount of motion that the uh, the WAMP was undertaking, was going through in terms of uh, detection and effectiveness, and I guess both with precision and recall uh, during the first these days. I know I've had a lot of trouble with that with the sonar bus. I have not had any issues with that. Well, I, I think it's different for the sonar where you're actually needing like a, uh, you know, it's like it's active, so you need both a, to actually receive the signal. Whereas in, in imagery, I'm just essentially looking at the relative location, and so I don't think the motion has really impacted it. I, I guess I haven't tried to. It would, it would be interesting to check, but I don't think it. Yeah, I, it's entirely possible it's much better for the optical. One of the problems with the, uh, the sonar is as the platform's moving around, the sonar is reflecting off the float at different angles, the seabed at different angles, and so you get these kind of ghost image, these artifacts of the sonar process that crop up throughout the field of view, and there's no optical equivalent to that. Um, et cetera, so. yeah. I well, think I would say it's very likely in high seas that you'll be in a, in a position where you're just missing fish because there would be one here, right? But in terms of actual impact on the images itself. But and I don't know, yeah, you get cool. bubble entrainment as well, which if you can't see anything, then you already see fish. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, maybe does she, in, in that optic, acoustic processing, does she use character parameters in the deep learning that um, uh, describe the, the motion of the fish as well? So if the platform's moving, does that? Yeah, it doesn't. So the, the, the so it's not deep learning. It's a, it's a random forest uh, algorithm. and one of the attributes is object uh, is track velocity okay. and so if you have a lot of motion and it's basically if the platform is moving to the object it will think it has speed associated with it and will make an incorrect it will have incorrect information into the classification that was not the major problem but we couldn't even really get past the detection problem okay. it, it, we do have the ability to determine the size of the objects using the stereo classification and if we were trying to automate that and then use that the you know, attempt to get like velocity, then a motion, the motion would absolutely be applied for that, right? But for the actual classification stuff, no. Yeah, I was going to ask the question about like right now, it seems like you're not really taking advantage of the fact that you have stereo imagery other than kind of the, the blanking. Yeah. So I, I didn't include it here, but yeah, we it's very easy um, manually to get um, images, um, sizes of the images, and we have that implemented. Um, automating that. If I if I knew correspondence better than kind of my well, or maybe using the stereo rectification approach, I could also get um, size estimations. Getting that to a point where it could you know get size estimations and track as it goes is, is another pretty big step. But but we absolutely have people to get sizes. Yeah. 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 Um, do you does your deep learning use um, like image to image kind of Correspondence or is it all yeah, a single? It's, it's single. Yeah. We can, I mean, it would be cool to do like a, a series, like time series. Um, but I don't think it's okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.